Hello and welcome to our weekly Parsha Shear with the commentary of the al I first of all have to apologize that this uh, is being um, put up online a little bit late this week, but it is the day before Rosh Hashanah and I'm sure, like me, you have found time slipping away the entire week. Anyway, uh, we're here now. Uh, just let me uh, remind you if you'd like to sponsor the Shear or to celebrate Simcha or to commemorate somebody who's passed away, then just write to yy at rabbiyy.com, yy at rabbiyy.com. I'll be very happy to make that dedication for you. There's no dedications this week. Everybody's very busy at Rosh Hashanah. So I will dedicate this uh, selfishly uh, for my children and my grandchildren. Uh, they should all have a year of health, wealth, success, shalom, nachas from the children. They should be, in that sense, a, a source of nachas to uh, me. And of course, the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and of course, themselves. So there you are. I've stolen, I've stolen a dedication. This week's Parsha, which I think will probably be a bit short, shorter than usual, um, is the Parsha of, uh, of Ha'azinu. And it's a song. It's almost as much as, I think the English word is swan song, this final song to the Jewish people. And it's very poetic. And it talks about the relationship with the Jewish people and what will happen you know, if we fail, etc. And the Alshik has got lots to say in this, obviously. I think it's time for me to share the screen so you can see uh, exactly the psukim. We won't be spending a long time on the Alshik tonight because I've got other things to say because it's there of Rosh Hashanah. But anyway, um, let's share the screen. And here we go. And so you should be, I'll move you over here. Here are some interesting things. I think I can minimize that. And we're going to put this up. Good. And here is Parsha Zazino. Hazino Hashemayim Adabera. Hazino Gevir would probably be the translation. Sounds a bit strange, but anyway, listen perhaps. Uh, to the uh, heavens, listen, Adabera, and I will speak. But Sishma Oris Imrafi. And the land of the earth should listen to the words of my mouth. That's all. That's all we're going to consider. Let me squish this up to the top. For a second. The Rashi and everybody else, the Madrashim, contrast that with the words of, well, very similar words by the prophet Ishiyahu. And I'm trying to get this both in. And you can hear the clicking of the, mad clicking of the mouse. Hazina Shemaim Ba'adabera. So Moshe says to the, first of all, he addresses the heavens. Hazina Shemaim Ba'adabera. The Sishma Oritz and the earth speak. But, but Ishiyahu does, does it differently. I don't know why I did that. Oh, I can shrink it. That's better. He says, Hazin Ishiyahu, the version of, uh, the, the vision of, of Yishio, go to the second positive. Shima HaShemaim. Now he's got Shemaim first, the same as, as Moshe does over here. But instead of saying Azino, he says Shimu. The other word, Shema. Again, listen here. We'll, we'll translate that properly in a second. Bazina Oret. And the earth should give the should give ear. Moshe said, let the heavens give ear. Okay, let's shrink those two. Let's turn to the al -Shuk. One big column for us to get through. I'm not going to look at all of it because I've got other things to say tonight, as is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. If I make this a bit bigger, if I can. Oh, that's good. good. So he wants to know, why is it that Moshe Rabbeinu says to the, to the heavens, Azinu? I'm going to tell you what he says outside before we dip into the actual text of the al Shah himself. The difference between Shema and Azinu is if somebody is close to you, you say, listen. So it's, it's, the closer you are, you would use the word listen to what I'm saying. If you're far away, say, Shema, hear what I'm saying. Listen and hear. Listen and fight, even in English, I think it has that connotation. Listen. So, but hear means I want you to hear because can you hear that? Something far away. So this is what the al says. He says, Moshe, you can see I've written the word close here. Moshe says to the Shemaim Azinu. Why? Because Moshe was so much near heavens that that's why I use the word which denotes, connotes somebody speaking to somebody who's nearby. But that's not what the Yishiyahu says. 
because he's farther away from heaven. He's not on the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. So he says, Hazinu to the, to, to, the, to the earth. He's nearer to the earth. And then when he's talk, Moshe is talking to the earth, it's the Sishma. Answer number one. But notice, says the Alshach, when, when he's talking to the heavens, he says, Adabero. When he's speaking to the earth, he says, Amira, what, the word Amira. Now, they both mean speak. But again, there's a difference. Daber is to speak harshly. Amira is to speak gently. To give a very classic metaphor, um, the difference between the two is that it's a father and a mother. Uh, if the, the child does something wrong, the mother is likely to speak softly. The father is like, less likely to speak softly, or the harsh father. When Moshe is speaking to the heavens, he speaks, he speaks harshly, strongly. When he speaks to the earth, not so. Why not? So let's share the screen again and let's look what the Alshach has to say. So he says the following thing. Right. Omnum. Here Moshe Rabbeinu is telling off the Jewish people, or rather warning the Jewish people of mistakes that they might make. On the possible a Pesach, he begins his words, but Bola Achich is strong. Yav does Hashem pain ra tovalem. When he's warning them about the things that they could do wrong, he says, you know what? You might feel disheartened. You might feel, as a consequence, uh, that wow, we're always going to be in trouble. But the Alshak is saying that Moshe is saying that I want you to pay attention to the fact that there is an enormous benefit. To keeping the Torah, keeping its mitzvahs, becoming a tzaddik. A tzaddik can command heaven. A tzaddik can command heaven. And that's why he gives the example of when Yaakov Avinu, says it just here, when Yaakov Avinu uh, sends Malachim, uh, angels, to his brother Esau, he literally sends angels. He's able to command angels. When a person reaches the level of, level of a tzaddik, he has the ability to command the heavens, and even the creatures of the heavens. And Moshe Rabbeinu is a tzaddik. He's able to do that. That's why it says the, the strong language, Daber. How Zeno, listen heavens, be Daber, and I'm, I'm speaking to you. you got to tell, you got to do what I tell you to do. Let's see this here. Um, okay, so when a tzaddik is speaking, I feel him as short as the alien, when he's speaking even to the, the servants of, of Hashem, to the Malachim. Asher b'shemayim kevoidim sorry ma'al nishmasai. It really means, <coughs> the servants of Hashem. Angels of God came to escort Yaakov when he left Eretz Yisrael to collect it, to collect his wives and create a family. There was the angels waiting to greet him to bring him back. And again, as I said, he sent some of the angels. The Alshach makes this point clear to his brother Esau. But feel the hogger, and even in the case of Hogger, Abraham Avinu's wife, second wife, Shifka Sore, who was merely a Shifka of Sore, a lieutenant of Sore. Three angels come to see her. Someone who's a tzaddik commands angels. Because a tzaddik commands the heavens. This is important. But when he's talking, when we're talking about human beings, or it's the people who live in this world, since human beings have freedom of choice, even a tzaddik can't command human beings. Human beings are given freedom of choice. You can't tell a human being what to do. There's a good chance they'll rebel. In law, al Unless you get somebody to agree through his freedom of choice. That's why it says, Hazinu. Moshe says to the heavens, Hazinu, listen. And it's a commandment. Vashkito. And he tells them to be quiet. Vashkito Shemayim. Hazinu. Shemayim. I feel Yashem, even the creatures, the, the creations that create the, that, that live in, in the heavens, Sarofi, Malochim, or whatever these creatures are. Kadesha, so I can't say it, but Adabera, and I'm going to speak. Kitzadik, Moshul, Akol, because Atzadik has got control over everything that Hashem created that doesn't have freedom of choice. But feel ki Adabar, Alem, Kush, and even I'm speaking to you harshly. Shehu inyan dibar, that's what dibar means. So that's, we go back up here. Azina shemayim, I'm going to speak harshly. But, says the Alsha, as he writes on, and he carries on here, but when he's speaking to people in this world, 
people in our world, it has to be a mirror, gentle speech. They've got freedom of choice. When you're speaking to human beings, you want to convince human beings, you have to speak to them warmly and with warmth and encouragingly. So bear that in mind, a mirror, speaking to human beings gently. Let me tell you a story. I had the great good fortune to be close to the late Manchester Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Siegel, the Katsana Yudrocha. Rabbi Siegel, in case you haven't, or he's not on your radar screen, uh, was a real tzaddik. A sort of people, a sort of person rather, that people flooded from all over, flocked, I should have said, from all over the world to get his blessings. So I want to tell you a story about this great tzaddik. So the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, I had used to have an organization for women. We, it was three shirin that were said every week by myself, the Manchester Rosh Hashiva's uh, son in law. Uh, Ramosha Kubitz, so I'm for Shlim, it's not so well at the moment. And the late Dan Weston, who sadly passed away from Corona, just about six, seven, eight months ago. And we gave three shirin, about 180 ladies used to come there. And because it was a successful program, I thought it would be a wonderful idea to invite the Rosh Hashiva to address a dinner that I had organized to celebrate a whole year of learning. I went down to Manchester Yeshiva on Sunday to see if I could get to see the Rosh Hashiva. Outside his office, which has also had a, a little bed in it, he was an elderly gentleman, he used to go for a sleep on a Sunday afternoon, before afternoon, say, before the learning started in the afternoon. And there was four people who had come from all over the world to get his advice. There was one fellow from London, one from New York, one from Chicago, if I remember rightly, and one from Rams Israel. They all had appointments. I didn't have an appointment. So everybody had a, a safer Jewish book in their hands, um, learning and waiting for him to start his, um, his afternoon uh, sessions of uh, consultations and advice, which if I remember right, it was at two o'clock, but it was past two o'clock. So one of the people who had come from abroad plucked up the courage, I might even say the chutzpah, and opened the door and peeked in to see if the Rosh Hashiva was awake from his afternoon sleep. And he closed the door quickly and he turned to the rest of us and he said, the Manchester Rosh Hashiva, has, he's just been in the basic keys, he's just been in the restroom, the bathroom and uh, he'll be out in a second and indeed he was. Now the Manchester Rosh Hashim was a very small uh, diminutive tzaddik. Incidentally if you've ever seen pictures of Ramon Moshe Feinstein he was very tiny physically but of course a giant in all other ways. Anyway so the door opened and the Manchester Rosh Hashim looked out and he looked at me and he gave me a little nod and I gave a little nod back and then the first person to go in went, went in. The door closed and of course, they all had appointments. I naturally assumed that would be the end. But suddenly, the door opened again, and there was the Manchester Rosh Hashiva looking at me. He said, "Yehudi Yaina, Yehudi Yaina." And he called me over. And I said, "Yes, Rosh Hashiva." He said, "Yehudi Yaina, are you saying shirim today? Are you giving any shirim today?" I said, "Yes, Rosh Hashiva. Later, I'm giving shirim." So he said to the fellow from New York, Rabbi Rubenstein is saying shirim today. He has to come in first. I have to admit, I was feeling rather pleased with myself, and so I went in. And the Rosh Hashiva said, you do, you and I have just been to the base of Kisei. Just been to the toilet, I have to make the blessing. It's a blessing you made, of course, I'll show you answer. And so he, uh, he said, sit down, it was a large conference table. I sat down and he sat down. He took out a cedar. And this is exactly what happened. He opened the cedar to the words of the brocha that you say after you've been to the toilet. Asher Yotzer, it's a very small, very straightforward blessing. And he started to turn the pages till he came to the blessing. When he got to the blessing, this is what happened. He looked, covered his eyes, and he started to cry. And he said the first word, Baruch. <laughs> and then he translated the word Baruch, Hebrew, into, into Yiddish. <laughs> and this carried on. Death. I think if I remember rightly, it took three or four minutes for him to say the bracha shayotza, which I could say in about four seconds. I had fl floated in a few minutes ago when I had been given priority by the Rosh Hashiva, and I felt quite pleased with myself. When I watched the kavona, I watched the sincerity that, Hashem, that, that the Rosh Hashiva put into speaking to Hashem, these, these words of bracha, I didn't feel so good about myself after all. I don't think I was such a great Jew now. I mean, if I, somebody gives me a piece of chocolate, of course I made the brocha shakal. 
how much concentration, dedication, Kavona do I put into the Shakoni Bibra? No, my focus isn't on the blessing, my focus is on the chocolate. Go on, Shakoni Bibra. Roshiba, that's the amount of time you took. And why I say this is because when Moshe Rabbeinu was speaking, as the Alshah said to the, Jew, to the Jewish people, he's had to speak to them gently because people of Bakir, people need encouragement. And a very good friend of mine called Robert Mejerovic, who was uh, one of the Magidi Shiva, the nearby Shiva here in, in, uh, in Long Island, uh, Ochar Yoshin, he gave me um, a letter which was sent, photostatted, uh, sent from the Shiva of Mir to the Talmudim of, of Mir, who had made their homes in America, to encourage them to keep the connections and the customs, the Menhogim of the yeshiva of Mir. And when I read this, I was really very interested in what I had to say. Listen to this. Um, it says, the Islam, the Babrochus, the Roshayna, the Menuchus, and the Moshova, when it comes to saying the first blessing of the Amidah, of the Shemana Esra, he said, you should say these blessings, this blessing with great concentration. That means to say, concentrate in each and every single word of the first blessing of the Shema Esra in its own right. To such a degree that when you say the word Boruch, you should have in mind that there is no other word that you've got to say. That's it. The Shema Esra is just the word Boruch. Think about the word Boruch. What does the word Boruch mean? What have you learned about the word Boruch? Focus on that. And then go to the next one. And then I got that. That's what the Rosh Hashiva, who was a Talmud of the Mir, was doing when I watched him make the Asha Yotza. Baruch, and he was concentrating. His, his mamalosh in his first language was Yiddish. He translated the Yiddish. He was thinking about Baruch. I thought, I thought you know what? Next time I have someone else, I'm going to try it as well. Focus on each word. It's good to concentrate on the first blessing of the Shemona Ezra, but focus on each word. And I tried it. Baruch. I mean, what does Baruch mean? I was thinking of all the, the things that I was seeing about the word Baruch. It, doesn't, does, it just doesn't mean blessed. It means to expand. As Rabbi Shosalanta points out. And after I'd exhausted my well, extensive knowledge of the word Baruch, and then tried to move on to the next word, and then I stopped because I thought, next word's Atal. I couldn't say it. Atal? Atal? You? Look, when uh, a prestigious Choshev rabbi comes into a room, and you speak to him, then the minhag is to speak to him in the third person. Would the Rav like? Does the Rav think? Or a Rosh Hashiva? Can the Rosh Hashiva give a shear? Would the Rosh Hashiva like to do this, that, the other? Indeed, when we speak to royalty, to the Queen, start off with Your Majesty. You don't speak to them in the first person. But here is the King of Kings. And we say, at all? When it comes to Rosh Hashanah, Sometimes we despair because we look at the entire year and all our mistakes that we've done over the year. We should never despair. Because the Apostle says, We are children of Hashem as well. We speak to him in the first person. The relationship, you've got to honor your mother and your father, but you don't say, can father lend me father's car? He said, dad, can you lend me the car? Can you lend me the car? Because it's family. We speak to Hashem as Baruch, in the first person, because we are sons and daughters of Hashem Yisbarach. And that's the sort of encouragement we need. But let's stick with the Rosh Hashima. When I'm in Manchester, um, I always go to visit his kever. It's a place that people make um, pilgrimages to go to daven in the skus of the Rosh Hashima for serious things they want to try and get Hashem's intervention. And it's a very successful place to dive. Before I dive in there once, um, the, one of the Rosh Hashivas soaring, this one, Year of Adas, was on the windowsill. I thought it would be a schus, um, a merit for him and for me to learn some of his Torah before I actually uh, pray in this holy place. Um, to Hashem, uh, as it were, uh, with the hope that uh, the, the Rosh Hashiva might intervene on my, on my behalf of the heavenly, heavenly court. So I just happened to turn it at random and I came to, this is the Rosh Hashiva's commentary on Shari Tshuva, Rabbeinu Yonah's famous Shari Tshuva, because tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah and 
it's all about teshuva. And Rabbeinu Yonah says this, um, right? and if you've done lots of things wrong and consciously rebelled against what Hashem wanted to do, you've rebelled a lot. Even such a person, the doors of tshuva are never closed to anyone. Shema says in Yeshiyahu, Shuva al Asher la Ha Miko al Sora, come back to come back to me. Shuva Bonim Shovim Rapet Mosha Sekam. My sons, come back, come back, and I'll cure you of your of your sins. And this is what the Roshi, I think I'll read to the Roshi. The Mancha Roshi who says the following thing. Rabina Bo, Rabina Yoda comes here. Shu Lakazak Asana de In Mokam Yosh. He comes to assure us that there is no place, and there should be no place in our minds. Or Jewish despair, uh, convincing yourself that you're beyond help, you're beyond forgiveness. As Asil Shasharim says, even for adultery and even for murder, there is forgiveness. He, read, he, read, he writes on. The Afim over Adam Averis Kol Yomo. If a person has lived a life full of Averis, the Shav Lefim is and you do Tshuva, a sincere Tshuva, just before you die, it's forgiven. The absolute most powerful weapon in the, in the armory of the Yitzhara is Yush, despair. They make you depressed, they make you despair. It will trick you into thinking there is no value to your apology or your regret. Because since your life has been so totally devoted to doing things which were offensive to God, you're toast, you're finished. Of course, you become depressed and, and despair because of that. And you will even start to do Teshuvah. It says, Rav Aaron Kalina was quoted as saying, Even though it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah, Amongst the 613 mitzvahs, that depression is a, is prohibited. Thou shalt not get depressed. On the masha at sasiyachol legram in shumavera acheret siyachol legram. But what depression, despair, giving up can achieve in destroying a Jew is much more successful, much more powerful than anything else. Okay, and therefore, bo rabbeinu lachaskenu. That's why rabbeinu yana comes here to us to encourage us. But Dalsi Chuva in an alam la the gates of Chuva are never ever closed. I um, am very friendly with somebody called Rabbi Professor Dr. David Gottlieb. He's a Boston also. And once he asked the Boston Rebbe the following question The Litvaks, the Yeshivisha world, my world, often have the Minhag or adopt the Minhag before they go to sleep at night, before they say Shema spend a few minutes reviewing their day to see you know, where they went right, where they went wrong, their mistakes, etc. Is that, he asked his Rebbe, the Boston Rebbe, a good minhag to adopt? He was interested in adopting it for himself. The Boston Rebbe considered it for a few seconds and said, yes, I think it's a very good minhag to adopt as long as you consider your achievements first. Before you start to look at your day and where you went wrong and things that you maybe lost your temper or whatever, think of all the things you got right. That's important. Rosh Hashanah is just around the corner. I don't think it will succeed with any of us if people shout and scream. Yes, it's a Vino Malkinu, and Malkinu is indeed obviously a scary image. The king, you did that off of his head. But before we come to the word Malkinu, the word before that's the Vino our father. And there's no father who doesn't want to see his son or his daughter come back again. So yes, um, we should do tshuva. But think of all, and I will do as well, I'll stand there and think of all the things that I slipped up in and messed up in last year. But you've also got to remember all the things you did right, all your achievements. You've got to think that you are a good Jew. Because that gives you the encouragement that you need the essential encouragement, as the Alshuk said, even Moshe Rabbeinu, 
I mean, imagine standing in front of him and telling you, giving you advice or constructive criticism. Wouldn't you accept it? Maybe not. Because you've got the fear. And the Yitzhahara can get in there and mess you up. No. Be encouraged. Be encouraged this Rosh Hashanah. Of course, there are going to be things that you have to apologize for. But also remember all the things that you've done well, that you've got right. You know, in last year, in my master, or in my senior, actually, <coughs> I had all my New Year's resolutions. So I, you know, always dabbled with a minion, a little, a little picture, a little, got from the internet picture, some men dabbling with a shawl, uh, various other things. There's always about six or seven. And I've got a screen here. My wife gave me a screen where all the photos of my family, my kids, you know, pop up in the screen with one, <laughs> with a single little grandson popping up now. Yeah, here. Oh, yeah, here. Um, anyway, so I, I can see all my grandsons and granddaughters popping up, and of course, I enjoy that enormously. And also, I took a picture of the inside of my cedar with all the things that I wanted to work on. And the other nine, they popped up. And of the seven that I got last year, I was quite pleased. I got most of them right. Uh, did I do things wrong last year? No, <laughs> well, obviously. But remember the strengths that you have as well. You're not going to get this Rosh Hashanah right by not knocking yourself down, by tearing yourself down and becoming depressed. It's got to be encouraging. The words have to be encouraging. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu, why Moshe Rabbeinu, when he's speaking to the earth, the people, speaks with the word Amira, words of Amira, gentle, encouraging words. We knew that. We deserve that. It's appropriate because we're sons and daughters of Hashem. He wants us back again. Let me wish you all a Kasibo Ximatoiva. I shall look forward to seeing you next week. Um, well, Yom, Yom Kippur then. And uh, we should have a great year, one where all the difficulties of last year are forgotten and we move on from them all. Kasibo Ximatoiva.